Yes, we all know this tune. Even if you don't know its name, you've heard it everywhere. The most overplayed music of all time, the cliche of all cliches, very much loved and hated at the same time by many people, is known to most of us today as Parker Bell's Canon in D. Over the past few decades, it has crept into every part of our lives and unfortunately became an icon of classical music in our modern culture. It has been played in numerous movies, commercials, weddings, and appears constantly in albums in the likes of relaxing classical music or the best of Baroque music, etc. It even once appeared in the list of top 10 makeup tunes of all time. The point is, it's everywhere. But what might surprise you is that Parker Bell's canon was pretty much unknown to the public until the late 1960s, when French conductor Jean-Francois Payard released a recording that attracted much of the attention that snowballed into its immense popularity today. Other than being heard literally everywhere, another big part of his legacy lies in its chord progression, or what we commonly refer to as the Parker Bell progression. It consists of eight chords that repeat over and over again, built upon a constant bass line. And this is how it goes. While there are some songs that are clearly rip-offs of Parker Bell's canon, there are tons of music that borrows the Parker Bell progression in a more subtle way. Here are just a few examples. It has also made its way beyond the Western world and proved to be a huge influence in Asian pop music. Its use is so ubiquitous in the last few decades that it has been called the godfather of pop music. So a tune went from being completely unknown to arguably the biggest influence on today's pop music in just a few decades. What's so special about Parker Bell's canon, and why did it become so popular? Well, first off, let's talk a bit about Parker Bell, because he deserves more than just being known as the guy who wrote canon in D. Johann Parker Bell was a 17th century German composer who lived in what we call today as the Baroque period. He was a prolific and highly influential composer of his time and made huge contributions to the development of Baroque keyboard music. The context around Parker Bell's life is important as later we will see how that could have influenced his canon. As a virtuoso organist, Parker Bell went through training during a time that placed a huge emphasis on improvisation. Improvisation during the Baroque period was an extremely important skill for any keyboardist to have since they had to be able to come up with music with just a given bass line. There were also certain formulas of commonly used progressions which everyone knew and keyboardists improvised upon. One of these was a Romanesca progression, which flourished in the 16th century. This is particularly interesting since it resembles the Parker Bell progression with the descending fourths. If we just listen to the first four chords of these two progressions, they sound almost exactly the same. There were also many treatises on improvisation written during that time, and in one of them called The Division View by Christopher Simpson from 1659, there is once again a progression that very closely resembles Parker Bell's. Similar progressions were actually really common during that time. So when Parker Bell wrote his canon later in the late 17th century, the so-called Parker Bell progression was nothing new to a listener during his time. Let's take a closer look at Parker Bell's canon. While the exact date of the composition is unknown, it is believed to be written between 1680 and 1706, together with a much lesser known second movement, Jig. 
originally scored for three violins and basso continuo, the piece was completely unknown to the public until as recently as the early 20th century, only to be first published in 1919. Canon is a musical form in which several instruments or voices imitate each other by playing the same melody starting at different times. In Pachelbel's Canon, the three violins have the exact same melody two bars apart from each other. What's also special in this canon, in particular, is the use of a ground bass, which is a repeated bass line that happens throughout a piece of music. This ground bass here is exactly the famous bass line that we all know, and serves as a foundation for the music's chord progression. When we talk about a constant, repetitive bass line, another type of music that shares a similar characteristic is, well, pop music. The very reason why the Pachelbel progression got quickly embraced by our pop culture is that it's something relatable and familiar to all of us. Repeated bass lines and repeated cycles of chords that happen over and over again throughout the song. Now, before Pachelbel's canon got published and was made known to the public, other composers also used the exact same progression, including Beethoven in his Sonata No. 30 in the first movement. and also this excerpt from Mozart's Magic Flute. So it is clear that the Pachelbel progression is not owned by Pachelbel, but also used by many other composers independently throughout history. Over the years, its versatility has given itself a timeless quality, as something that is able to be easily adapted into vastly different styles of music. So what's so attractive about this progression that composers including Pachelbel so frequently use it in their music? Previously, we talked about how during the Baroque period, people often improvised on repeated bass lines. What made this particular progression stand out is the use of what we call a sequence. In musical terms, a sequence is a restatement of a melodic or harmonic idea that is higher or lower as compared to the original idea. A good example would be these few bars of Do Re Mi from Sound of Music, where there is an ascending sequence since the music goes up every time it gets repeated. So, a needle pulling thread, la, a note to follow so, tea, a drink with jam and bread. Similarly, we see a series of sequences in the Pachelbel progression since the music goes down every time it's repeated. In this case, it is, therefore, a descending sequence. And it turns out that sequences happen a lot in music, and for very good reasons. It is both compelling to the listener and the performer. For the listener, the restatement of something familiar gives a sense of unity within the music and a change in pitch for every sequence draws the music away from the danger of being too repetitive. For the performer, or very often the improviser, playing the same pattern is much easier, since all they have to do is repeat the same passage at a higher or lower pitch. While there are other progressions based on sequences, what makes the Pachelbel progression even stronger is the possibility of extremely smooth and natural voice leading. Voice leading is the linear movement of melodic lines that interact with each other to produce harmony. In Pachelbel's original piece, the violins enter with a descending line that moves in steps. These small steps are considered to be good voice leading since they allow the music to be more easily performed and they just generally sound better and smoother. In many of later adaptions of this progression, composers also frequently change the bass line by adding inversions so it can have a smooth voice leading as well with the descending steps. So through a brief analysis of the Pachelbel progression, we can see how easily it can be a candidate to be used extensively in pop music today, where there are also elements like a repeated bass line, sequences to make the music more memorable, and smooth voice leading so that songs can be more easily sung. When Paya released the seminal 1968 recording of Pachelbel's Canon, it's a little bit different from the original. There are some additional parts that Pachelbel didn't write, and also, it's much slower. It's actually an arrangement by Paya, and apparently very different from the original version. 
But this is the version that made it into our modern charts. It became the one that everyone knew. A romanticized rendition that is more pensive and sentimental, as opposed to the more flamboyant and flowing character in the original version. While it might be unfortunate that part of the original piece is lost through the multiple layers of adaptation, it's this very adaptability that brought the canon to the level of exposure it has today. And now, we also know that the sheer amount of music inspired by the canon was not just taken from Pachelbel, but a long list of musicians in the past who all collectively recognized the power of this chord progression. And by the way, chord progressions cannot be copyrighted, so there's no such thing as plagiarism when it comes to this. So the next time you hear a song that sounds very much like the canon, besides immediately criticizing it, we can also try to appreciate how the progression has been adapted into a new context. Ultimately, it's a timeless musical artifact like nothing else, which might just be as ubiquitous in the years to come.